Well, hello and uh, welcome back to the Ethics Across the Curriculum and the Yard Workshop 2021. Uh, I'm Jeff McCreese. I'm the Deputy Director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, and it's a great honor here to welcome Provost Catherine Cermak uh, for a discussion on learning outcomes. So, Provost Cermak, uh, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, and, and good morning to everybody. Um, thank you all for coming back. You know, we're, we're halfway through uh, Ethics Across the Curriculum in the Yard Week, and Monday and Tuesday were a lot of it was about the lead curriculum and setting the foundations for the projects that you're working on. Today we're going to shift over to a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of lesson planning um, and, and how we get to where it is that we want our midshipmen to be at. And so I just want to take a moment and look at the learning outcomes um, <clears throat> that we started this workshop with. And so Jeff, please jump in at any time and, and Allison too. Um, the workshop as a whole provides uh, interactions between participants and the guest speakers, and this is designed to create connections across the Naval Academy. And so that speaks to learning outcome five, the collaborating with key influencers um, and sharing the challenges and incorporating um, how we do ethics across the yard in all of our different areas. And then Monday and Tuesday was the foundation of the lead division um, core curriculum, taking us through the four core courses. And that really speaks to learning outcomes one and two about comprehending the basic principles of the courses and in particular the ethics course. And then number four, um, Allison kind of helped step us through on Monday about um, creating uh, the connections between our professional areas and curricular content. And so that's that's sort of how far we've come just in the last two days. Are there any questions about any of that? Do you feel like you're you've started down the path to accomplishing these learning outcomes? Okay. So today we're going to focus more on three and four, which is constructing effective learning outcomes and developing curricular content that integrates um, ethics into different activities, regardless of where we are in the yard. Um, curriculum is usually the words associated with academics, but it's, it's from the Latin to run. And it refers actually to the, the course that chariots used to run around. And so you can think of it as a course in, of anything, a course of study, but also any sort of path where you're moving along in milestones to reach a, a goal of the finish line. And so um, today, I. Um, I want us to just sort of have a foundation for being really thoughtful and intentional about how it is that we incorporate ethics into those different milestones that we want to take midshipmen along. And to do that, I'm going to start with um, the end, but you know, this is my agenda for today. So where are we going? Um, why do we do this? So transparency in learning and in, uh, in our teaching. The elements of the learning outcome and then uh, structured collaboration activity. And so we're going to, at the end, practice our learning outcomes in our three domains in, in hopefully a way that's entertaining and um, effective at helping to kind of um, transfer those skills uh, to different areas to practice transferring it and to increase retention. So <clears throat> going back to um, where are we going? You saw the quad chart on day one. And you know, we start at the top with, why is this important? Why are we doing this at all? And then moving sort of to the end, the learning outcomes, what is it that we're gonna want people to do as a result? So we've got an important idea in our head that we, we have a sense that we need to do work in, but it's very helpful to articulate what is success going to look like in that area? And so that's developing the learning outcomes. The assessment plan um, is really, is it observable? How will we know success when we see it? And is it more than just, you know, well, I know it when I see it, I get a good feeling from that person, or is it something that's observable? The lesson plan then is, are we intentionally creating activities that support the learning that we expect? And then finally, next step, this is all uh, a work in progress. You're probably not going to complete your projects 
in a week. Um, maybe not even in a semester. It all kind of you have your own timelines. So when you leave here, it'd be good if you're thinking about what are the challenges and what are the resources, um, the research resources over here in Moose Hall and all around the yard and each other that you can bring to bear on your remaining challenges. And so everybody have a, a good sense of how that quad chart is um, kind of a design to help set you up for success while you're here, but also once you leave this workshop. Do you have anything else on the flight chart? No, thanks. Okay. All right. So transparency. Um, I started today by trying to be transparent. I shared my agenda. Went back over the review, um, the learning outcomes for this workshop, and then you know talked a little bit about where it is that we're trying to go in terms of your um, the presentation that's going to happen on Friday. When I've been at um, the Center for Teaching and Learning um, book groups, we often the question will come up around a specific topic. How do we try to be transparent? How do we try to do that within our teaching? So I think maybe just take maybe a minute for you to think about how it is within your types of instruction and try to be transparent with your learners. And we'll come back around and talk about that. So jot down whatever ideas you have. volunteers to share? Yeah. I mean, from a coaching perspective, I feel like uh, it's really important that we practice what we preach. So uh, if I make a mistake, I'm pretty open with my athletes about, hey, you know, I, I let you down in this case. Uh, if an athlete makes a mistake, uh, and I feel like we can all gain from learning about that, I may ask them to, you know, admit to their situation and kind of explain how they got there and, and what they learned from that opportunity. Yeah, so modeling the behavior that you want to see, encouraging others. <laughs> yeah, I, I think transparency is the best way to connect uh, with someone else. And especially in, in a classroom where I'm you know, the age I am and the kids are the age they are. And, you know, there, there's this huge gap, right? So by being transparent and open, and, and I share a lot about, you know, what's going on with me and family. I mean, it's just, it's just a complete open book. And by, by doing that, they see me as, you know, they, they see me more as, as more as a person. And because of that, then we're connected in the classroom as opposed to you know, my, and my wife's a PhD teacher at Towson. So I, I get a lot of stuff from her. And she doesn't do any of that, by the way. Anything about her family, but she's been this whole sage on the stage concept, right? Right. So I don't want to be a sage on the stage, right? I want to connect with the kids, and the fact that I'm also a coach, I know how to talk. I've been coaching for so long, I know how to talk to kids. So by doing that, uh, I'm able to connect with them, and I think they get more out of it, and I get more out of it because they open up more to me, and I actually hear what they're thinking. They're not telling me what they think I'm wanting to. I actually hear what's going. On. Right, so you're you're kind of exposing your life a little bit, but letting them know once again, modeling that sort of behavior that they're free to talk about their lives and and that you care about them. Right, which is 
actually very important for learning. <laughs> Anyone else? I would just add that uh, with the midshipmen, I, I think showing humility and vulnerability is important, um, at least to, it works really well with sailors and help, help me connect and command with sailors. Um, and I, I think it works here too. And it, just like Coach was saying, you know, you're, you're, we're real people. We're no different, we're no better, we're no worse. We've made the same mistakes. And I think if we approach midshipmen in that way with that tone, um, that we get more of a, a positive reaction and response. Another thing that I do personally is disclose my positionality, who I am, and what's the perspective that I'm presenting things, right? So where I am coming from, this is my perspective, this is the position that I occupy, so they can see clearly where this is coming from. And I acknowledge there are other perspectives on the blind spots, right? Mm -hmm. We all do have blind spots. So recognizing that, to say, well, this is what I can see and this is what I can present to you. From there, you have to explore more, but this is what I have to offer. Right, and you're kind of defining the scope of, you know, this is where you're coming from. There are other positions, but also sort of letting know what are sort of the, the realm of other positions. Mm -hmm. Somebody who teaches in the social sciences, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not whatever you believe is is actual, but how do you develop? So, you know, my position as a social scientist, um, that I bring expertise to this and explaining that, and therefore they can bring their position, but they have to follow some of the, the rules and guidelines of the field to bring that into the classroom. One, one thing I try to tell, sorry. Um, when I'm teaching, I'm usually teaching information literacy, research skills, that sort of thing. Um, when you, when you were like a young a baby librarian, you go in the classroom, you go in like very prepared with everything all set. And I don't I don't do that anymore. I want to demonstrate to them that this process is messy and nonlinear and it's not easy. And so if they're struggling with it, there's a reason for that. We all struggle with it. I do, your professors do. So just trying to make make transparent that it is a uh, it's a messy process. Yeah, and that's that's something that the literature and teaching comes to a lot is that um, students would probably learn more if we let them see the mistakes or told them, you know, the see stories of uh, how many times it took me to get this published in a journal. That this isn't just because we're experts in our field doesn't mean that it's all just a straight linear process for us. Um, that they they learn a lot from knowing that things, um, you know, it's a real it's a uh, come back around to the same sorts of questions and problems and have to go over it until you get it right. And, you know, in the lab or when you're um, trying to publish a paper or something like that, that sometimes we make mistakes and those mistakes are really great learning experiences. But if we only show ourselves at our, our best, then it might seem like it's not achievable to them. I was just going to chime in about uh, who I work towards, and I'm not perfect at that, but uh, continue to struggle with is consistency. Sort of consistency of the message, consistency, you know, when, when one is giving feedback to students, that what what my priorities are for their learning pretty much stay the same throughout. And they're not confused that on the next test, I'm just going to upend all of that and be like, no, now I value this. Right. Yeah, so a lot of this um, is in the, the literature on um, learning that students um, get a lot from us. Ex implicitly, we know what it is that we want our athletes, our students, our mentees to, to learn, but making that visible to them is then helpful for them to move along that process. That if you explain why you're doing things, I always think back to Karate Kid on this. So you probably know what I'm about to say, wax on, wax off. And you, you kind of think about that and go, I, I don't know if that's a good way to learn the, the, the motor skills for karate or not. Um, but what a frustrating way to try to learn how to do something when you can't make any connection between the activity that you're doing and the outcome that, that you want to have. 
And so explaining why it is that we do um, what we do can be, can be very helpful. And then there's a um, recent research that says sharing your learning outcomes near the beginning and then as you go through um, helps students in particular helps uh, transfer students students of color and first generation students so possibly um, students who aren't first generation kind of have a sense of how to find learning outcomes and what it is that they're expected to demonstrate whereas the transfer students who are all often also first generation students and students of color um, don't really know sort of the meta how to be a student. So explaining that and then being consistent throughout and, and going back to it's not every week is an entirely new class. There's this consistent strand that goes throughout it um, has been demonstrated to be very helpful to the students in increasing their learning. And so I did include, I don't know if it's in your handout, but it's um, on the Google Classroom uh, website on uh, Transparency in Learning and Teaching is called TILT. It has a lot of useful suggestions and advice for incorporating that into your class. Um, so now sort of onto learning outcomes, which is you know, part of the, the transparency, being upfront with where it is that you want your students to, to end up at. How many of you are familiar with learning outcomes? How many are you familiar with SMART goals? So almost everybody, they're very similar, um, has some sort of knowledge of this idea of um, what a learning outcome is. And I'll go into sort of the, the elements, the anatomy of a learning outcome. Um, but wh why do we have these learning outcomes? Why do teachers have them? What do they do for students? Any thoughts? How, you win. how to win what 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 does success look like yeah. right so for teachers it's really helpful because for backwards planning of your course if you don't know where it is that you want students to end up at you're probably just giving them a lot of content and then you're testing on content but it's not necessarily leading to a bigger picture of what you want from your students um on, on sort of a a larger, grander scale. It's like you just want them to know stuff, and do you just want them to do well on the test, or do you want them to be able to apply that? Do you want them to use it in their lives? And then for students, like for them, it's what is it that you want me to achieve, and how can I kind of monitor and track myself as we go through this? Um, if they're if they're paying attention, and if you're bringing it up to them throughout be really helpful for them to have a better understanding of why they're taking the class and think of it more perhaps from an extrinsic rather or sorry an intrinsic motivation than the extrinsic I just want to get a good grade in here. All right so the elements of a learning outcome um, first is you know they're learner centered and <clears throat> From that they're, they're written from the perspective of what the student will know or be able to do um, or what sorts of values they will possess as a result of whatever this sort of instructional um, moment or learning experience is and the next is this should be something that's observable um, i don't hear it so much anymore but when i first started an assessment i would normally ask well how do you know your students are doing what it is that you you expect them to do, and I well, I can I can see it, I can see it in their eyes. And I was thinking, you know, I've always thought if only, and I'm sure that there's a, so some sort of machine that exists that can measure the sparkle in somebody's eye, and then we would know how much they were learning. Or maybe you know they're just daydreaming about um, the beach or something, and that's why they've got that sparkle in their eye. I'm not really sure. So to think of it in terms of um, what is it that can be observed with the, the learning that you expect your students to have. Uh, under, uh, just sort of a side note. Um, so when, when we think about this, typically we're looking for verbs. Of, you know, they can list things, they can explain things, they can analyze things. Um, they, they can possess uh, and explain their, their value system, something along those lines. 
it, it's really easy just to default to they'll understand. And <laughs> understand is, it's not a bad word. It means it's good to understand things, right? But it's really hard to know when somebody understands something, unless you think about what does it look like? And then generally you, you can find a different term. It's also a pretty, um, sometimes a pretty low bar. They understand it. Is, is that good enough? They understand the rules. Oh my gosh, they do other things, but they understand the rules. You know, we, we actually want them to use that information in some fashion, generally. Um, so thinking about where it is that you want them to end up. Um, achievable, and that, that kind of goes to, are we supporting the learning? Are we setting them up for success on this? And you know, during the COVID environment, um, it, many times I, I heard and, and also said, we can't assess them on things that we never taught them. But you know, there were things that had to come out of the curriculum. And it's like, well, how can we use our, our traditional assessment tools? Sometimes we can't. If, we, if we're not having sort of intentional, thoughtful moments, these probably are not things that we should be assessing students on. So the learning outcomes um, need to be achievable. We need to support them. Uh, clear. So we all have language. I, I certainly have my jargon. Um, but they should be things that our learners can understand. Um, maybe they're supposed to learn the language of the field, and so it's appropriate to have that within the outcome, but be thoughtful about what you put in there so that your learners um, have, a, have a chance of understanding what it is that you do expect of them. And then lastly, uh, important, and we were just talking the other day that, you know, that whatever it is that we're doing, there's always um, a desire to shoehorn something else in there. You know, whatever the class is, it can do another thing um, to help support the mission. Um, we just, we want to get more out of it. And so when we think about having a discrete number of sort of overarching learning outcomes, what is it that we prioritize? And so the learning outcomes can help us decide what, what is really important that we do and what are things that we'd like to do. Um, but they're not our first um, required things that we have to accomplish. And so I have sort of the, the template. You know, as a result of an educational activity, learners will be able to some sort of observable, measurable verb um, do something. And so you know, at the conclusion of this workshop, participants will be able to construct effective learning outcomes related to ethical content within their um, relevant discipline or professional area. So that's, that's a real kind of quick overview of learning outcomes. Any questions about that? Does it seem achievable? Okay. Closely related to, to learning outcomes are, are learning domains. And this is usually where we're pulling those verbs from. And so there are, there are three learning domains that they overlap each other. Typically um, in academia, and this came out of edu um, education programs, we really have only focused on the cognitive and kind of ignored how um, psychomotor is often a part of what we do, um, maybe not the main focus and how effective domain is something that if you want students to learn, having some sort of attachment to what it is that they're learning is helpful. And so it's, it's the cognitive, psychomotor, and effective, and basically think, feel, do. And so at the bottom of that is sort of the basic where you start. Um, so in the cognitive, it's you know, memorizing stuff, knowing stuff. And then as you move up, it becomes more and more complex. And so as you uh, think about your projects, I would encourage you to ask yourself, you know, what are the, the cognitive skills and strategies that midshipmen will need to be successful? And then <clears throat> what motor skills will they need in order to achieve the goals? And then finally, are there attitudes or things in the effective domain that will be helpful for them to accomplish what you're setting out for them. And maybe it's not just 
your particular learning outcome. Maybe it's, you know, these are um, dispositions that are going to be helpful for them immediately, but um, in their careers, uh, in their in their majors, in their lives. And how does that relate to what it is that we want our students to learn? One well, question. Yep. So with the midshipmen, and, and you guys obviously have more experience than other schools as educators. So you know, I teach a core course, and I try to get them to care about the course, but it's still a lot of them that's not the grade. And because we hire all our graduates, no matter what, they're going to have a job. And if they graduate, if they right? Graduate, <laughs> I think graduation rate is pretty high compared to the old days. So how do we how do we get them? I guess out of maybe necessarily the cognitive side and get into the other ways when really in, in kind of in their mind I think it's, it just doesn't really matter. Maybe get a good grade from a third marathon or get to pick what I really want to do as opposed to maybe someone at Towson University where my wife teaches who's in a major who's selling out to that major because that's their career is that major and that's what they're going to do mm -hmm. to get a job. Does that make sense? So, so how do we get the mids to oh. think that way? That's my how do, how do you get them to move from the extrinsic? I right. just yes. want a good grade yeah. and, and to move on yeah. to and, and doing using some of these, you know, getting into the other yeah. learning buildings, I guess. Rather right. than just you know, focus on the evaluation. <clears throat> anybody any thoughts on how you've done this in your areas or <laughs> or is it just I, I have the same yeah, issue? Yeah. <laughs> In the spirit of transparency, I'll tell you one thing that, that I do that I don't recommend. Um, I don't allow extensions whatsoever, um, and it doesn't matter. And I just made that decision, like on the first day, because I thought it was absurd that I would give a bitch of an extension, right? I don't know exactly what I was thinking. But of course, their, their question is like, well, why? You know, you're a monster. Why won't you allow <laughs> sanctions? And I said, because your counterpart in the People's Liberation Army Navy is working harder than you and me right now. And that's all I said. So it's an example of what not to do, maybe. But it worked. Like they were immediately motivated. Um, I still don't allow sanctions because I feel like I have to stick with that. <laughs> but that's not a good reason. And I give sanctions to anybody to ask for any reason. <laughs> Jim, let me, let me take a stab at that. When we think in the classroom uh, what it is we're trying to do, we're, we're typically looking at the cognitive domain. We're teaching somebody to, to, to learn how to work with the periodic table, or we're teaching about the French Revolution and its impact on nationalism, or we're teaching them how to do uh, c computing integrals, whatever it is, where it requires what we typically think of as this, it's it's learning in the in the cognitive domain. Likewise, if we're maybe on the sports field, we're talking about how to, you know, how to work in your golf swing and how to keep your head down or how to ballroom dance or whatever. We're thinking about learning in the psychomotor domain where we're talking about muscle memory, maybe, you know, the physical part of flying a plane. But we're talking about attitudes, which is what I think you're getting at. How do we change somebody's attitude? Then we're talking about learning in the affective domain. And, you know, I, I've been humbly trying to grapple with this assessment piece for maybe 15 years now. And that's the learning domain that I am least aware of. And I think personally, it's the most difficult to get to. I can teach somebody about the impact of the French Revolution or uh, the Arab Spring. But how do you get somebody to change their rotten attitude? Well, that's something very, very different. And Catherine, I don't know whether you're going to step through the steps in the affective domain, but um, we, Stockdale Center has been involved recently the past year and a half in racial reconciliation, racial matters. You know, how do you change somebody's prejudices? How do you change somebody's feeling when they see somebody who doesn't look like them? It would be nice if you could just put them in a classroom and talk about, you know, cognitive you know, the science behind that, but it's it's different. It's about getting somebody to change their attitude and heart and mind. And I personally think, and, and Catherine, I, I think is gonna step through this 
for my benefit, if nobody else's, you, you gotta somehow change somebody's emotional response inside. And that's hard. So it doesn't get us further down the line of how to do it, but um, there are certain steps, just there are certain steps in the cognitive domain as to how we move from very basic to much more advanced skills, so too with changes in the affective domain or, or attitudes or hearts and minds. And, and, that, and that's the cultural aspect. Mm, yeah. So yesterday, the second day we had the plea for spring football, and we said, hey, so we want to call the super hot in there, so we give them a break. And we said, hey, this Q&A on spring football. Over half the questions were about academics. What about this class? How does this work? No, we're here for spring football. <laughs> but that's, that's what they're focused on is, That'll, that'll change. Say, you know, <laughs> two weeks in, you know, and they're worried, you know, what happens if I miss a test? How, how's that going to, you know, that's what they're worried about. So it just seems so focused on that. How do we get them to care and change their part about, it's not just about that, right? It's not just about learning this so you can regurgitate it so you can get a higher merit so you can be a sub -learner. Dang it, I get called out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> probably very rhetorical. Well, you know, Coach, the, the academics in the room are probably saying, hmm, I get the opposite tonight. I get our people more concerned about my chemistry. Like, yeah, it really warms my heart that this is what they're thinking about. I hated that. <laughs> so I, I, I read recently a book by uh, Adam Grant, who some of you may know, organizational psychologist at Wharton. And uh, he works for the New York Times. And, and in this issue, he has an article, and it's also in his book, Think Again, about how does one change someone's mind. And the example of the New York Times article was how do you talk to somebody who is reluctant to be vaccinated? And, and the technique he was talking about in that article was motivational interviewing. And so I just want to throw that out there for people who are interested. You can probably Google it and find the article where I can share it. Another concept that I have been working on and uh, reading about is the concept of investment. Uh, one by one she's the first to read this. And basically, what she says is students will invest in their class if they see themselves there. So, something that I have been playing with, and that's why I'm trying to introspect and try to incorporate in my class the themes of leadership and ethics, which is because I want them to see themselves in my course. Why Latin America, Latin America is important for them? Why the courses of Latinos in the US that I teach is important for them? If they can see their identity there, they will invest in the course. There are some students that are naturally vested. Because maybe they are Latinos, their parents or grandparents are second or third generation immigrants, so they are naturally affected. But there are others that are like them. They are, you know, I ask them, why are you taking this, this course? I want to know what's their motivation, but that, how can I enhance that investment in the course? If they see themselves, they will, they will invest there. So the idea is to get to know your students. That I try to do that. And also, what themes are important? We know that there are going to be naval officers and there are going to be girls that are doing the school. So what are the topics that are in their hearts? How can I use that and leverage that in my class? So those are some of the tips that I can give you <laughs> some time. If I can just uh, bring us back as well as the learning outcomes, um, I think that one of the things in terms of evaluating, the more that you can be specific about what you actually want them to value, the easier that becomes. So I think in my mind when I first started, I was like, oh, I really want them to value philosophy and I want them to love this theory that I love. But actually what I, I don't care about that as much as I want them to value the process of being deliberate and reflective about the kind of person that they want to be, right? And so if you, as you're thinking about learning outcomes in these different domains, the more precise you can be about them, I think that will gives you a more realistic target to hit, but also helps you be explicit about what you actually want them to do and be. 
And I think that makes you more likely to be successful, I, I would think, as well. Um, not that we're always even successful in that, but at least at least then you're you're being you're being specific about well what is it that I actually want them to value? What is it that I want them to be able to intend? I mean it might not be it might not need a value philosophy of Kant, but maybe it's or even the class, right? But maybe it's, it's something about it, some specific aspect, or some process, right? Well our learning outcomes and things go very very specific. Yeah. Well, yeah. like really, really <laughs> Yeah, they are. They are probably over. Well, I'm not saying they're over. Like, I mean, but it's it's helpful. I think it's helpful. I don't know if it's helpful to students. Helpful for me. Of, hey, this is what I have to make sure they know this. Week. Yeah. And it's not very. It's not broad. It's very. Yeah, they are all cognitive though. That's the interesting right. thing. And right. maybe we need to think more about that. Maybe 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 I know I need to think more about what I'm. Right. So I'll, maybe when I give the example. For the effective domain, kind of step through um, from receiving through internalizing, that might help. But, you know, but start. Is, is it worth commenting that when we talk about effective domain, right, when you're still looking at stressors and pressures from the environment, that that also is going to affect the cognitive domain? So, for example, here's last year with COVID and everything that was going on, clearly that was affecting not only students, but faculty, everybody. And therefore, you know, one could get a sense of, hey, you know what, this this impact on the effective domain is going to have also a direct impact on the cognitive domain and what we're trying to teach here as well. Is, is there anything to that? These, these domains do overlap to varying degrees. Um, they're, they're not discrete silos. And to the extent that we've really treated them that way, we're, we're probably done a disservice to our learners. So yeah, I think there is an effect um, so, between them. Unlike the example that Coach provided, where everybody was very interested in academics, right? I recently went through some interviews on one of our selection processes, and there wasn't a single individual that really, you know, that really said, "Oh, I love, you know, academic world." They basically said, "I hate going to school." <laughs> so again, that's part of the effective domain, uh, right? If, if what we're trying to you know, teach them is a love of learning and uh, a desire to be intellectually curious. Um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> not where we want them to end up at. <laughs> but my point is, to Marcus's point, I think this effective domain will look at all these different challenges that we have right now in this day and age. Probably worth doing thinking. And I think that those stressors and pressures, as you say, are going to relate to how receptive they are. To making those sorts of changes, right. and, and hopefully some of those will go away. But their midshipmen are always going to have varying pressures by design in their in their lives, which may affect their willingness to really engage in um, just a surface attitudinal change versus thinking about where do I want to end up, what do I want to internalize as a person. I think the more we can be explicit with them, though, as we think through that, it will be helpful. So let me um, start with Bloom's cognitive domain, since that's the one that always gets the love. Um, <clears throat> and this is, you know, in, in academics and um, as this sort of thing has been introduced to other areas, we've generally shaped things around the cognitive. And so starting um, on the top left hand side, Starting with knowledge, which is just um, students' ability to remember. And in the, that center pie piece, um, you know, you demonstrate remember by I can define things, I can list them, um, recall. Then moving from that is comprehension. And then we go to the tabooish word of understanding. What does understanding look like? Um, so, how is it that a student sort of translates what? They, they know into a different form. How do they explain what they know, um, categorize it? What, what can they do with that information to show that it's more than just a memorized list? Then application um, uh, is that the learner uses knowledge and is um, able to generalize it to other situations that applies it to those things. So illustrating, diagramming, examining something, uh, analysis is the next step, um, separating information to component parts. So that would be distinguishing, um, compare and contrast, being able to you know, make a table uh, showing the pros and cons of a situation. 
then in the revised Bloom's taxonomy evaluation comes next. And that's uh, learner is able to use their information, use the previous four steps to make a judgment about something. And then finally, synthesis is the last, and that's you know your ability to take all of that and use it to create something novel, something new from the situation. So I usually use um, healthcare examples because generally nobody is in healthcare and they're not here to tell me I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> but thinking about you know in terms of knowledge, you know, a med student should be able to recall and list all of the symptoms of a disease, but we want them to, to move behind that to comprehension. And maybe comprehension is the, uh, they can categorize information into different diagnostic categories. Next is gonna be application. And that's, um, you know, they can take that knowledge that they have about the symptoms and the different sorts of um, symptoms and different systems within the human body and use that, apply it when they interview a patient um, to get information. Analysis is going to be based on that information that they gathered. They're able to determine what else they need to know. And then that what they know is going to go into evaluation, actually creating that judgment of, I've diagnosed you. Um, I now have determined what it is that your disease is based upon those previous steps. And then lastly, um, synthesis, you can sort of imagine being used in based on the disease, based on the knowledge of the patient, um, is going to be creating a treatment plan that actually stands a chance that the patient's going to follow through on it and it's going to be successful. So that sort of uh, blooms cognitive domain in a nutshell there. Everybody good with that one? Anything you want to add? When you're constructing learning outcomes, I found the most important part of, of that task is grabbing the action verb that you think this student or player or midshipman ought to know or be able to do and intuitively asking yourself where along this do I want to fall is it a very basic function or is it a much more advanced function so choosing that action verb to me is is the most challenging part but also uh, the most fulfilling part in getting closest to where uh, I want them to be. The, the next one is uh, Dave's psychomotor domain. And it's, you know, we don't want them to just know stuff um, and only apply it in a theoretical sort of way. Typically, we want often want students to be able to do things. And I was thinking about this. You know, we. we almost never talk about this in academics and I think, well, this is something that is either for young children um, or is something that's out on the athletic field. And then I, I remember that Sylvia's here. Okay. And I thought, well, students need to be able not just to have the vocabulary, they have to be able to pronounce the words. And, and that those are motor skills that are taking place there in the laboratory. It's not just being able to answer a multiple choice test about how to use the equipment. It's safely and effectively using the equipment. Um, so this is all around us. This may not make it into the, the big grand overarching learning outcomes for the class, but they are um, at the very least supporting outcomes or, or enabling outcomes for what it is that we want to do. And so with uh, Dave's taxonomy for the psychomotor domain, it starts off in the top right there with imitation. You know, the learner is basically just mimicking according to an exemplar or an example that they've seen. Uh, next is manipulation, which is that they have some sort of guidance. They have instructions to help bring them along on this. Uh, the next then is precision at the bottom. And so that's you know having greater control, being able to start to naturalize things being more accurate with what you're doing. Um, articulation is then being able to actually use this sort of in real life. So you're you're modifying, you're you're using it on the fly. It's not, um, you know, it's the difference in the driving range and the golf course, I suppose. That it's not just a skill that you're practicing isolated from other skills. And then naturalization is basically, as the word implies, that. This is something that you kind of do automatically. 
home. As you as you become more and more proficient, you're going to be becoming natural at what it is that you do. <clears throat> and so back back to my med student, you know, if they're if they're doing a physical um, and they're taking um, blood pressure, well, the first way to do it would be I've seen other people take blood pressure. It's been taken on me, and I'm just going to imitate it. And tell Jeff my amusing story of. Uh, when I was about 13 and my mom asked me to take her blood pressure and she still has her arm um, <laughs> but I really needed to go to that next manipulation stage of having somebody explain to me what it is that you're, you're you've got the stethoscope on what you're listening to um, how high it is that you're going to take the, the blood pressure up to you don't just keep cranking it waiting for something to happen um, other, you know, you don't want your, your patient yelling to be what happens. <laughs> so the first, you know, would just be, I've seen other people take blood pressure. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a cuff on somebody's arm. Maybe I know a little bit about how to face it and how high up it should be, but I'm just copying the actions without really understanding um, anything more than that. And the next manipulation, you're being guided in how to do something properly. So precision, um, you know, might be I, I can take your uh, your blood pressure with no need for anybody to explain it. The articulation stage is maybe I'm taking your blood pressure. I'm also determining um, how clammy your skin is, if you're dehydrated, getting your pulse in there while I'm working on this. I can combine skills together. And then when I'm a natural, you know, you, you come into my office and I just do this. I don't have to stop and think about doing these things. I don't need a checklist to guide me. I know how to do it and how to respond to different situations. And so um, that's the a quick and dirty of the, the psychomotor domain. And then finally, and I left um, the effective to last because I think that's uh, probably the, the domain that we're in some senses more most concerned about for an ethics across the curriculum workshop is uh, Crathwell's taxonomy. And that the first area is receiving. Um, and I think this is what you were speaking to is your strength football players were not in a, in a position to be receiving information, uh, valuing what it was that it was that you were there to provide them with. And so you didn't have that willingness. And without that, it's hard to move to the rest. Um, and so then after that is responding. Um, that, so, you know, in receiving, maybe they're actively listening. They have a willingness to hear. They're, they're paying attention. Um, in responding, they're actively participating. They're, they're listening. They're asking questions. Um, they want follow-on information. The third is valuing, and that's... Um, that they're going to be attaching some sort of um, worth to what it is that you're trying to transmit to them. So in some way, they're they're starting to really sort of support the idea of what it is that we're hoping that they learn. In organizing, um, they're they're taking the these new values and they're seeing how this fits in with. There are other values that they've already brought with them, how to prioritize it, how it fits with what they've learned and who they are as a person. And then in the last is internalizing. And that's um, behaving in a way that is consistent. So it becomes uh, a natural way of responding. And they've internalized the value system. And so back to our, our med student. Um, in, you know, in order for a healthcare provider to adopt a team approach to patient care with receiving, they're going to have to be open to receiving information from a patient um, through an interview, through observation. They have to value what it is that the patient is bringing to them and actively listen and observe them. Responding would be requesting additional information from the patient. Um, and you know, coming maybe to an agreement on, on what sorts of tests and things are appropriate to perform next. And then at the bottom, valuing um, that they, they're seeking the patient feedback to ensure that the treatment plan is viable, that they're they're making, they're not just doing it to get to the diagnosis 
and to flip to the page in the book with this is how you treat this, but that they actually believe that the patient as a member of their own healthcare team is important. Um, organizing would be creating that, the internal value system that is going to balance their expertise and their knowledge with the patient's um, role in this and that there may be things that they could do faster, um, but that they have to bring the patient along as a member of the team and the steps that go into that. And so they might prioritize things differently. And then uh, lastly, internalizing would be that, you know, they are consistently acting in this way and making their healthcare patient centered and um, including their patients as participants. And so I, I presented these these three domains separately, and it's how they're they're conceived of. But there's a lot of overlap between them. And um, I think as we, as we think about our learning outcomes and what it is that we want students to do in terms of ethics, going back and asking those questions about not just the cognitive strategies, but what are what kind of attitudinal changes or value systems would you like them to end at? And how can we help them? Um, perhaps by making some of this, you know, transparent to them of where we're trying to go. And so, any questions about the three domains? All right. So, hopefully, those are helpful to you in terms of how to make the sort of learning that you want your students to have. To make sure it's important and. Um, to sort of make that movement towards what is the appropriate verb, what is it that we want to observe from them. All right, so I, I hope everybody got the link to the set game instructions um, that was sent out yesterday. And um, we're in an appropriate receiving mode to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go along and I'm going to pay attention to this, even though I don't see any possible connection. Um, <clears throat> but what um, I want to do is try to use that game to illustrate the three learning outcomes um, and how to craft, or, or the three learning domains and how to craft outcomes within those domains. And so we have sort of three tasks. Um, one is to, um, we're going to set you up with my do-it-yourself uh, cards, um, to work as a team to master sort of the rules of the game and be able to play it. Um, while you're doing this, to consider how the learnings and the behaviors that you exhibit um, are relevant to different um, to the different domains, the cognitive, the psychomotor, and the affective. And then lastly, to uh, craft some learning outcomes using those elements of a, a good learning outcome. And um, <clears throat> we're going to then, hopefully this will work, and come back and be able to share that information and talk about the learning outcomes and maybe work a little bit together to make the best possible ones. And so just a real quick review. Um, the traditional deck has 81 cards, are here, but we're gonna just start with the solid cards because it's, it's an easier, faster way to learn this. Has anybody here, were you all familiar with set before? Anybody? No, no, no. You were? Okay. I figured there'd be at least one person. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're going to, the, the cards each has a different shape. Um, there, there are three shapes, oval, squiggles, diamonds, three colors, red, purple, green, and then they'll have uh, one to three shapes on each card. And if you're playing the, the uh, full game, you also have shading or patterns. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll start with just the shorter one. And the I, objective then is to make sets. And sets are basically just if-then statements. Um, so for every two cards, there's only one possible matching card. And so for this, you'd look at it and say, um, because the first two cards are green, then the last card has to be green. Because the first two cards are diamond, the last card has to be a diamond. Um, they're solid, so then it has to be a solid. But because the first two cards are different numbers, the last card cannot be the same number as one of the other two. 
And so like here, um, look a little bit familiar to you. Mm -hmm. You know, if, since the first are two different colors, the last one can't be, can't repeat a color. But they're all ovals um, and they're all number two, so that then has to be repeated. So I'm going to, uh, how much time do you want to, 15 minutes? As much time as you want. So let's, uh, in 15 minutes, maybe we'll check in, see how you're coming along on this. The setup for this is going to be three to four people per team. I don't, if this space doesn't allow, maybe we want to use the, uh, the hallway. You go out there in the hallway, if you like. And uh, you start with 12 cards and um, create the sets. But remember, the, the tasks are related to the learning outcomes, working teamwork um, to master the game, thinking about the different uh, domains and what are the outcomes that we may be able to craft as a result of this. And so we've got decks of cards for our, whoever it is who wants to head up each of the three teams. And if you're a little confused on the rules, that's part of the team work. So it's 10 16, we'll regather at 10 30 in 14 minutes. Okay, so maybe we want to pause the record. Yes, please. Okay, so teams, uh, how about if we go? Tom, why don't you 